First question is, uh, what is your name and what's your relation to Bitcoin? Well, I'm uh, Peter Todd. I'm a consultant who goes and works for uh, quite a few Bitcoin-related, mostly kind of the sort of finance 2.0 stuff, like Mastercoin, Counterparty, Colored Coins. I'm also working for uh, Zero Cash now, the anonymous um, Bitcoin extension, and uh, also CoinKite, which is a sort of secure Bitcoin storage service. Yeah, all right. Uh, you've also been doing like uh, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin core development, right? Yeah, yeah, a bit, a bit of that. I mean, I'd say most of my focus is on better understanding the theory behind how does Bitcoin actually work. But, you know, part of that's also been some Bitcoin core development. All right. Um, what do you think of the, like, the status of, of Bitcoin right now? Well, you know, I think it's interesting how in some ways we're kind of at a bit of a crossroads. I think we are seeing Bitcoin really start to get the tension between centralization and convenience and decentralization, making Bitcoin what it is, you know, what Bitcoin is meant to be. Uh, you know, we've kind of seen this whole block, block size issue come up over and over again. And I think even more pressing is this tension between financial privacy and, you know, your ability to go transact freely and then people would much rather go see regulation and blacklisting and so on. And, you know, hearing Circle come out is, you know, talking all about how mainstream, mainstream and Bitcoin is important is going to be a very interesting question, seeing like, do people want to try to mold Bitcoin into something that's more regulatory friendly or are they going to stay the course? <coughs> and I think, for me personally, I think that the, the important question about that is that, that Will the, will the protocol itself, itself like stay neutral in that sense? Because obviously, like uh, Circle can or other companies can do do whatever they they do with their their business and, and everything. But as long as the like the protocol allows you to have things like the dark wallet and you know, and a coin join and all kinds of things, I, I think it it's, it kind of allows Bitcoin to to be part of uh, both worlds. But if, if, if the protocol gets compromised, then, then it's obviously a, a much bigger issue. So what's well, your opinion on that? You know, I think it's important to note, or really to ask, what do you mean by you say protocol? Do you mean like the software? Or no. do you mean the mining community around the software? Do you mean how people could use the software? I, I mean basically the, the nodes that run the network, like full nodes, like what, what are they actually, what are the rules that they, they play with? Like that's what I mean. Well, so, I mean, this is issue. The protocol and saying protocol in terms of the software and the bytes on the line, I don't see that as changing. What I do see is likely to change, I mean, assuming people allow it to, is, for instance, currently we assume Bitcoins are fungible. One Bitcoin is worth as much as any other. People are trying very hard to introduce the idea of blacklists, where even though Ethereum may be able to send a Bitcoin to you, it's not going to be valuable to you because you won't be able to go spend it at an exchange and turn it back to fiat. Because my coin may have come from some source that some government has declared to be blockless. You know, under what basis? Maybe it will be a legal thing. Maybe it will be... You know, it's kind of hard to say how that would work. But you can certainly say it would add a whole lot of overhead to Bitcoin. <coughs> I, don't, I don't personally think that that's ever going to like work because like the... the even even like a lot of people in the community seem to understand that that breaking the functionality of, of Bitcoin is a really bad thing. Like uh, I think they can try. Some some people can try to put that kind of stuff up, but I think that they, that they will have a lot of opposition because a lot of well, yeah. you know, if I were to ask, so would blacklist work? I think what we'd actually see is the turn into whitelists. In reality, the blacklist, so to speak, would include any coins whose source is not known or may have been mixed or may have been anonymized. And whether or not that works is really community acceptance, like you say. And I kind of wonder, I think it's quite easy to be in a position where the community accepts something not realizing where it goes. And you know, Adam Back made a great point about how the only reason Bitcoin has low transaction costs is because of the fungibility. Because you do not need to investigate the history of your counterparty. Because you know that when you get a coin, it'll be worth something. It's not going to be blacklisted later and you won't find out after the fact that now it's worthless. You know, 
the only way you can do that is by having transactional freedom. Yeah, I think that uh, I agree, and I think that uh, if the, those kind of uh, lists like kind of start to really appear and get used and, and so on, I think that that that's the kind of fundamental change that would actually like split the whole Bitcoin uh, to, to different either either Bitcoin itself would split to different networks, which is obviously a bad idea in many ways. Like uh, if, if you like have <laughs> different rules of different groups, because then you have Bitcoins, uh, like you have Bitcoins there, you have Bitcoins here. So probably what would happen is that some altcoins would just get uh, a lot more popular yeah. uh, if that would happen. Yeah. That's, uh, and I, and I and think that... You know, that's yeah. an interesting other question. Like what you're talking about is really the ability to go switch. And right now, as an example, suppose ghash.io was told by their local government, you know what, we've got this block list of coins, you will now no longer mine blocks that contain transaction coin list coins. And this is an idea that's being seriously proposed. I mean, Mike Kern wrote about it years ago. And if that happens currently, realistic miners are probably going to say, well, you're trying to go screw over the network, and that hashing power will leave that pool and move elsewhere. And if the next pool does the same thing, it will leave and move elsewhere. You know, we have this option to leave. We have these options to switch. Unfortunately, because the way the Bitcoin protocol works, it does not scale. So if we want to have 1,000 transactions per second, now your ability to run a full node and be that pool that people can switch to isn't necessarily there. I may not be able to run a pool and be anonymous at the same time. And if I'm not anonymous, I'm going to be next on the list for the government to go shut down, or a government, depending on where I live. And that's when something like blacklists really have effectively changed the protocol. You know, that's when Circle, for instance, deciding that, all right, we're going to accept the government blacklist and we're going to take part in it actually starts to matter. Because the next level is restricting miners. Yeah. You know, and currently, as I say, we're at a crossroads. We're not at the point where, you know, Bitcoin is still free enough that it would be very hard to implement. But if you go down paths where you say achieve scalability by just increasing block size, you know that's one of the worries. And that'll be very interesting seeing how people react to that. Yeah, it is. It is true. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, what do what do you think will happen? What's like your speculation on how how things will go? Maybe one year, two years forward. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I mean, I've got you know. Proposals I've worked on, like tree chains, and other people propose like side chains and so on. There's different trade offs, there's off chain transactions as well, which you know help the scalability stuff. I think privacy wise, it's a lot more clear to me that yes, technologies like coin joins, self addresses, as well as uh, zero cash will be implemented, and we'll see those technologies available for people wanting to transact privately. But how the thing with the mining will play out, I don't know. I mean, my hope is at every kind of step towards that path, we see the solutions just naturally progress. Because after all, Bitcoin uh, fees are a uh, marketplace. You know, the more transactions people want to do, the higher the fees go, and that naturally incentivizes people to find solutions. But, I don't know, maybe you could have an industry-wide effort to go and change Bitcoin into a model that can become centralized. And if so, I think that'd be very unfortunate. As for probabilities, I don't know, call it 50-50 for sake of argument. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, the good thing is that I, I think the important thing that at that point you, you really need to rely on the, on the not, not, not just Bitcoin, you need to rely the, on the cryptocurrency like the revolution. Because you, you'll, you'll have uh, alternatives. If, if Bitcoin becomes something different, you'll, you'll have something else taking its place. Uh, so feeling, feeling you'll have a uh, something filling every niche eventually we don't know if it's just one thing it can be different different yeah. uh, cryptos and so on i, ho I sure hope so it, <laughs> will, uh, it isn't necessarily trivial because one of the problems with proof of work consensus is your strength is how big you are you know if you went and saw governments or big businesses deciding we don't want bitcoin to exist at all or we want to really strongly regulate it they can 51 percent attack the network Curiously, they could 51% attack the network in a model of 
we're going to let it continue to exist, but we're going to impose our new our new rules, you know, our new blacklists, which I think is actually a very likely outcome. You know, you're not going to destroying Bitcoin entirely doesn't make sense. Changing what Bitcoin is fundamentally, that's the sort of thing I think I could expect to see, and that's what the community has pushed back on. Yeah, it's kind of uh, although like um, um, you can probably explain it better, but. As far as I know, it, it's fundamentally the, the actual um, user nodes are, are really in control of the fundamental rules of the, of the protocol, not miners. Like, uh, but this is the catch. Yeah. You know, for instance, Android Bitcoin wallet. It's a SPV wallet, multi-bits in the same classes as well, high wallets in the same class. And they do not verify the blockchain. Yeah, they they trust miners. And if miners wish to change the rules, they can change the rules. You know, a good example is miners could decide, all right, this deflationary aspect of Bitcoin is wrong. We're gonna make it deflationary according to some prescribed amount. You know, we want to be paid more money. And miners can go and change those rules. And SPD clients like Android Wallet will accept blocks that pay out, say, 100 Bitcoins.